I know of no one who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique. What perhaps is unique is the fact that I am willing to talk about it. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. Since the 1970s, scientists have been asking themselves, do we live in a simulation? Are we living in a computer program? And the reason that they're asking themselves these questions is because the more we know about our universe, about life, the less random it appears to be. So I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. So the wait, wait, I'm still, wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> When we ask the question, do we live in a matrix, what we're really asking here is do we live in a random reality, in a reality that is the product of a random sequence of events, or do we live in a reality that has been constructed? Now when we ask ourselves these types of questions, most of us settle on the explanation that we're given in school, that first there was a big bang and then there was evolution and after millions of years, well, here we are. Everything being totally random. We accept that without questioning any of the basic parts of that premise. Such as, where did the matter come from that supposedly big banged? Where did the energy come from to make things big bang? And perhaps what's even more perplexing here is how did life evolve out of non-living components given that nobody's ever seen that happen before? In part one of our series, we looked at a law in science called the law of biogenesis and how it's the most basic and fundamental law in biology and how it says that it takes life to get life. That you cannot, you can absolutely not get life from something that is not already alive. We've never seen it happen. We cannot do it in a lab. It cannot be done. Now, they don't call this the theory of biogenesis, they call it the law of biogenesis. And even though there's a law of biogenesis out there, they still teach people that the theory of evolution somehow explains the origins of life. Not only is that idea unfounded and scientifically impossible, it flies in the face of everything else we know about our physical world. Take the laws of entropy, for example. These laws say that things in our universe go from order to disorder. It's why things go from beginning to end. It's why they break down over time. It's why we constantly have to clean up after ourselves. Things are constantly going from order to disorder unless there's a type of intelligent intervention. Take a city, for example. If it weren't for human intervention, they would be overtaken by nature in just a matter of years. In the natural world, in a total random world, things go from order to disorder, not disorder to order. And this fact alone makes the idea of life evolving out of a random mechanism absolutely impossible. If matter is becoming more disordered with time, how could it possibly become ordered enough to become alive? Coupling that idea with the fact that we live on a Goldilocks planet where everything is just right leads us to the inevitable conclusion that we do in fact live in a constructed reality. Probability guarantees that. Imagine a world with a 48 hour day. Imagine how hot it would be or how cold it would be at night. We're not just the right distance away from the sun. Every possible variable is absolutely perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, what we see around us isn't about chance, it's about design. Therefore, everything around us is the way it is for a reason. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. It's all part of a program governed by rules. That's the reason. The real question here is where did these rules come from? The inescapable truth here, my friends, is that there is a matrix. There is a dream world and the people who believe evolution is the explanation for the origins of life are the ones living in that dream world. They are living in a virtual reality, in a matrix within the matrix. That's ironic, isn't it? And there's a reason for that. And this brings us back to the common theme you've heard of over and over again. In every movie, in every TV show, it's all about good versus evil. 
And that is why you need to question absolutely everything. Never assume anything you've been told is accurate. You couldn't possibly appreciate why people are telling you the things that they're telling you. Whether it's in school or on TV, the majority of the information that is being passed on to you is biased and compromised. In part two of this series, we talked a little about the dark side of the Matrix. And it is this dark side of the Matrix that is controlling the majority of the information that you're getting these days. It's not just the news that's inaccurate, it's the textbooks as well. Evil has one goal in mind, to sell you the illusion of truth. It says what is good is evil and what is evil is good. The further you are from understanding what is really going on in this world, the better it is for evil. And so evil will stop at nothing from corrupting your perception of reality. They're not just lying to you about 9-11 and Iraq and GMOs and the safety of frack water. They're lying to you about just about everything. To evil, a lie is a truth, and a truth is a lie. That is why I say to you, if you want to understand the matrix, if you want to understand our constructed reality, then you need to start looking in places that talk about this reality as a constructed reality. That means creation, folks. Genesis 1, chapter 1. Now, some of you are going to be like, oh, hold on there. I know exactly where you're going with this. Listen, friends, I'm being scientific about this. I'm not asking you to go out there and be a Catholic or a Protestant or a Methodist or a Baptist. I mean, it'd be nice if you were, but that's not what I'm saying here. I'm telling you to be methodical, be scientific, question everything. Every physicist, every mathematician is telling you the exact same thing here. The universe looks created. It looks like a program governed by equations. And it's not just physicists. It's chemists, it's geneticists, and you and you want to know why they're saying that? It's because what they're seeing in the DNA, in the physics equations, in the chemical reactions, it's about a reality governed by rules and equations. And it wouldn't make sense unless our reality was created. Why? Because somebody had to put these rules into place. Somebody had to program the very first DNA so that it would work and replicate. Without DNA, there couldn't possibly be evolution. From this point, there is just so much that we could talk about and expand upon and we could just spend hours if not days and years contemplating exactly what all of this means. And I suppose I should begin by reiterating an important theme of the Bible here. Our world was custom made and it's all we know for sure. We don't have a clue about what's really going on beyond our planet. We have no idea how long we've been on this planet for sure or how many quote unquote earths are actually out there. All we know is that we're here now and we've been given a handbook on how to conduct ourselves. That's the best way to look at it. Again, we could spend hours on the implications. Like, who else might be out here with us? Or say, how many times this reality has been reset? We say it's the year 2015, but who really knows? Who really knows how many times we've wiped ourselves off this very planet? In any case, with what remains of our time here today, I want to focus on what I think matters most. Our world is much more mysterious and complicated than we give it credit for. If you look at the moon, for example, that may be one of the most mysterious phenomena that you can freely observe. You may have noticed that it fits perfectly in between us and the sun. This fact alone tells you the moon didn't just end up that way by chance. The fact that it fits right in between us and the sun perfectly is just another statistical impossibility. So that means the moon didn't just get there. It was put there, just like the Bible says. Now, another mysterious aspect about the moon that you may not appreciate is that the moon doesn't ever rotate. Not really. It rotates just enough so that the front of it is always facing us. I mean, what are the chances of that? And what are the chances that the moon would look like a face looking at us? Have you ever thought to yourself, well, hey, maybe the moon isn't what we think it is. Well, you might be onto something there, my friend. The moon didn't just get there. It was brought there. Now, there's a lot of speculation to what the moon really is, and I'm not going to add fuel to that fire, but if you've ever seen a cell phone tower dressed up to look like a palm tree, then you know things aren't always what they seem. Moving on. Our world is full of mysterious clues like the moon, but it really only starts making sense if you understand what this reality is really about. It's about good versus evil. So start paying attention to your environment, my friend. Start paying attention to what happens at nightfall, for example. Why do you think they call it nightfall? Start looking up instead of looking down. It's as if there's something else that's falling to earth during nightfall. It isn't just darkness. Pay attention to it. I'm not sure what it is that's raining down with 
with darkness at night, but my guess is that it began its journey at dusk on the other side of the planet. I'll let that simmer for a while. Train your eyes to look at things that they wouldn't normally pick up. Kind of like when you look at a star at night by not looking directly at it. Start training your eyes to look at auras. The best way to begin there is by looking at people while looking at something else. Now you gotta be careful there. Not only will you start noticing that people have different types of auras, but you'll also notice that metallic objects such as planes and helicopters have different types of auras as well. I think most of you have probably already noticed that one by now. That's just another example of how things are more complicated than we give them credit for. Getting back to the basics though, if you want to understand the matrix, if you want to understand this constructed reality, then you have to begin with the user's guide to life, i.e. the Bible. Its purpose is to instruct you on how to conduct yourself. Its purpose is to teach you about logic, reason, and understanding. This matrix is full of automated systems that are out there to balance the equation, to reprimand you if you start treading down the dark path. So, if you want to avoid the worst this reality has to offer, then my best advice to you is to follow the rules set out in the user's guide. It's as simple as that. Lastly, I want to talk to you a little bit about prayer. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the system react to prayer. Your prayers can be answered, and those answers overrule everything. They defy logic, they defy understanding. You'll find example after example of that by talking to people around you and in the Gospels. So put that logic to good use as well, and watch your reality change around you. Prayer is the only way to appeal a decision to the power that created the universe. Be genuine and sincere with your prayers. Pray for others, give thanks often, and follow the Ten Commandments to the letter. Don't be a trendy when it comes to following those commandments. You should act and sound like the people did back in the 1950s, literally. So take the Matrix Challenge. Live your life according to the Ten Commandments for a month and watch the world change around you. Stranger Than Fiction News. Because truth is stranger than fiction.